this morning. Uh, thank you for sing praises to you, to worship you, and honor you and glorify you alone. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us by sending your son to the cross for our sins in our place. I thank you for what that does for us and how we can live uh, free from sin because of that. I pray this morning and the rest of this day that we would live in light of that and that we would live like we are changed people. I pray for this chapel. Uh, I pray for Hunter as uh, he comes up to bring your word. I just pray that you give him calmness and wisdom uh, to speak truth to us uh, through your word and for you to speak through him to us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, our speaker this morning is a junior from Tawanda, PA. I think many of you have had the opportunity of having him in your class. From my perspective, I see him to be a, a very gentle and kind man who loves Jesus Christ deeply. And I believe your heart will be encouraged today as you listen. Would you welcome Hunter Randall? Well, good morning, everyone, and everyone who's watching on the live stream. Hope that all of you are having an awesome morning so far. Awesome. So it's just an awesome opportunity to be in front of you, all of you today, and sharing God's Word with you. Just a great opportunity. Because if I'm going to be honest, if someone had told me when I started freshman year that I'd be up here speaking in chapel, I would have told you that you were crazy. So for those of you who are in the pastoral major, your time's coming. Just want to point that out there. But well, some of you know me better than others, but if you've noticed me around over the past couple weeks, you would have noticed that there's something different about me. I, I did dress nice, yes. I didn't get any taller, but I did get a haircut, as you can tell. Yeah, yeah, I did get a haircut. And I've had many people compliment me. Actually, the day of I got my haircut, I had multiple people compliment on how good it looked, which was great and awesome. I like that, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Truth be told. But... I was throwing a curveball a couple of days later. I think it was the next day after I got my hair cut. I went into one of my classes, and the professor, like just about everybody who saw my haircut, was just amazed at how different I looked. And he asked me this one question that I was just stunned by. He asked me the question, what was your motivation for getting your hair cut? I remember just, just as soon as I got, heard that, my, I just froze because I couldn't think of what my motivation was. It was I couldn't put it to words. Now, of course, the students fi figured it out pretty quickly, or at least they thought they did. They thought that I was doing it to impress a girl. I don't know what they got that idea from, which, which I, I will not confirm nor deny that at this point, but <laughs> it, it can leave that up to yourselves. But as, as I was thinking through that, as I was thinking about that encounter, that just made me think, you know, I'm probably not the only person who's ever struggled with this. I'm sure that there's many of us who have struggled with figuring out what their motivations are. Would you be able to answer if I asked you what your motivation was for dressing the way you do, for driving the car that you do, for getting up each morning and going to class, or if I can even be so bold as to ask this, why you're attending CSU? Because we, we sometimes struggle to figure out a motivation, and we're not nearly as effective as we can be without a clear motivation. I mean, if you, if you look at churches, if you look at businesses, they all have mission statements, which honestly, it's just their motivation. It's, it's designed to show why they do what they do. In fact, CSU has their own motivation, making students Christ-centered career ready. I did get that right, so yay. But... But just imagine CSU's impact without that mission statement. Sure, they would still be impactful, sure, but they wouldn't be as nearly as impactful as the school is without that motivation. All of you here are desiring to go to a future career. That's why you're here. You're here to get a degree to move on to a future career. 
And some of you have a motivation for why you're doing what you're doing. Some of you may want to, you know, make money, which is good, you know, you want a career that makes money, you know, that's provide for you and your family. Others may have a deep desire to help people, which is great. And some of you, you know, you want to please loved ones, like, you know, your parents or boyfriend or girlfriend, spouse. All those are not bad motivations, and they're not scripturally wrong motivations. But if you, if you think about it, we could do so much more than that. We can take our motivations to the next level, and by taking them to the next level, we can have such a greater impact for Christ. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, how can we take our motivations to the next level? How can we have a greater impact for Christ? Well, our text is going to answer that today. So I encourage you, if you have your Bible, whether it's physical or on your phone, to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to see in this text two motivations. Two motivations that will not only take our motivations to the next level, but that will allow us to have a greater impact for Christ. And so, I want, so as I read this passage, I want, I want you to see if you can discover what these motivations are. There's two motivations we're going to be talking about. So as I read, see if you can figure out what these motivations are as I start reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 starting in verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer to those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So right away as we jump into verse 11, we see our first motivation, which our first motivation that will allow us to have a greater impact for Christ is understanding the terror of the Lord understanding the terror of the Lord. Now, some of your translations might say fear of the Lord. I'm sure that some of you ha have heard that it's fear of the Lord means having an awe or respect for God, which, which that's, that's not wrong. In fact, that's referenced in multiple contexts about that. But that's not what this is talking about. This fear of the Lord is talking about an absolute terror, an absolute fear of of the Lord in reference to verse 10, which Nate talked about yesterday. So what Paul was saying in reference to this is about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, as Nate mentioned yesterday, the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. So when we as believers die, we are, we're going to be a, a, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's, God is going to judge our works, whether they were worthwhile or whether they were worthless. And as I think about that, I kind of wonder— why was Paul afraid about that? I mean, you know, not, not only was he going to be in the judgment seat of Christ, but he was also, he knew that Christians were going to be involved in the judgment seat of Christ. So why would Paul be afraid? Because you don't lose your salvation when you're in the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's not possible. Well, what Paul was focusing on, he was focusing on those who would not be in the judgment seat of Christ. You see, as Nate alluded to yesterday, there's another judgment that people will face, and that is the great white throne judgment. And that's for non-believers, for people who have not accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, this text does not talk about the great white throne judgment, but it does in Revelation chapter 20. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read you Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. I want you to hear as I'm reading this passage just to see what happens to those who appear before the great white throne judgment. So we'll start reading in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So did you guys catch what happens to non-believers who appear before this judgment? They get thrown into the lake of fire. Now, now when I read this passage, my first reference that I thought of was burning garbage. I'm going to show my true Pennsylvania side. My family burns garbage. We, I, I know, right? Can I get an amen about that? <laughs> right on. <laughs> right on. I like that. So, so what we do is, you know, we, we sort out our garbage. Like, we take, you know, the stuff that can be burned, and we burn it. And the stuff we can't, you know, we throw out like normal people. And when I was younger, when I was starting out burning garbage, like, I'd be over here, and the fire was over there, and I'd just throw the garbage into the fire because I didn't want to get near that because that fire is hot. I don't know if you've ever been burned by fire or touched fire or anything, but that is hot. And as I thought about that, that's my picture of people who are not saved going to be thrown into a fiery lake of fire. That doesn't sound like fun. That doesn't sound like, you know, a party or anything like that. It's, it's horrible because you're going to be thrown in a scorching heat, a scorching lake of fire that is going to be eternal pain, suffering, and judgment. Just to give you guys a, a glimpse at, at how bad it will be, um, I don't know how many of you ha- know the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, but it's in Luke chapter 16, which I'd encourage all of you to read on your own time after this. It's a great parable where Jesus gives a comparison between two groups of people. On one hand, you have the rich man, which was someone who had everything that that world had to offer at that time. You know, he was very well thought of in society, had all wealth and everything. Then you have the poor man, Lazarus. He was the low end of the totem pole, considered a poor man. They both die. The poor man goes to heaven, and the rich man goes to hell, or Hades. And we see, as he's in Hades, that he is suffering. He is suffering in Hades. He's, he's in this heat, this torment. And it's so bad that he begs. He begs for a drop of water on his tongue. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have never begged for a drop of water on my tongue in my life. So just imagine how bad it is being in the lake of fire. Because Hades, as we read it in the previous verse, verse 14 of chapter 20 of Revelation, that's thrown into the lake of fire. So just imagine that being so much worse. And that is where non-believers are going. That motivated Paul to share that with other people, to share with them as he could to save them from that lake of fire. And that should cause us to share that with others too. You know, I, I watched this video a few years ago of a man named Penn Gillette. I don't know if any of you have heard of him before. He's, he's a famous magician. He's part of the group Penn and Teller. But he's also famous for being an outspoken atheist. And he had a counter about 10 years ago, I believe it was, of a Christian businessman who came up to him after one of his shows and he gave him a Bible. He gave him a Bible because he desired for him to be rescued from hell because he knew where he was going. And I want you to see this clip. They're going to put up a clip here. And I want you to see Penn Teller's, Gillette's response to this. So watch the clip with me and see how he responds to this occasion. I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe 
that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever. And you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. I'm just amazed at what he did. He, he, he didn't care. You know, he didn't care if he was going to be insane or anything. He, his motivation was to get him out of the lake of fire. And he recognized that. Penn recognized that. And he was willing to give him that Bible. He knew his motivation. He knew that Penn was going to go to hell. He was going to go to the lake of fire. And he wanted to get him out of there. And so that should be our motivation as Christians as well. Because if we, as we continue on, going back into Second Corinthians chapter five, you know, Paul wanted to make his motivation clear, as we read in uh, continuing into verse eleven. He wanted to make manifest, or in other words, to be made clear, to be an open book. He wanted not only God, but he wanted the church of Corinth to know his motivation, which it wasn't, you know, just to get a pat on the back. It wasn't to make himself look good, but he wanted to get people out of there in a genuine sense. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure many of us have done things for the recognition of other people. I know I have. In fact, there's one example that comes to mind when I think about this. I'm sure many of you like music. I, I, I'm sure I can, you know, there's some talented musicians we have up here. I'm sure many of you do. But when I grew up in high school, I loved classic rock. I don't know how many of you listen to classic rock that much, but in high school, I was obsessed with it. In fact, I was so obsessed that if, if a classic rock song came on the radio, I could probably tell you the name of the song, the artist, the album it came out of, the year it came out, and maybe even the chart position. I, I know, I know. I, I was a little too obsessed. I kind of needed a little help with that. But, but if I think about it, you know, because I, I would do this with my family or my friends if a song came on the radio. And as I thought about it, I thought, who was I doing it for? You know, I wasn't doing it for my friends or family. They could care less about all that stuff about the song. I wasn't doing it for the artist because I haven't gotten my residual check from them yet for doing it. At least not yet anyway. But I was doing it for me. I was doing it because I wanted people to know how smart I was. I was doing it for that pat on the back. But Paul wasn't. In fact, Paul was even criticized for what he was doing. People called him crazy. They called him insane, which if you look at his life, kind of makes sense. I mean, if you look at the life of Paul, I mean, he got shipwrecked. He was put in prison. He was even stoned one time, but that didn't faze him. That did not faze him because he understood the severity of people going into the lake of fire. He understood the need for to share the love of Christ, to share Christ with other people. And that did not stop him. That didn't stop the businessman, the Christian businessman. And that shouldn't stop us either. Because doing this will allow us to not be comfortable. We will sacrifice our comforts. Because we like to be comfortable in America, right? We want people to accept us. We want people to, you know, allow us to fit in. We want all of that. But we will not. In fact, our media is more against Christianity than it ever has been in history. So we will face ridicule. We will face persecution. But like I said, Paul and the businessman, Christian businessman, were willing to risk it. And we can as well. So as, as you interact with people, as you interact with those who do not know Christ, I challenge you to read back, go back, and read through Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Because in this passage, it very clearly points out where non-believers go when they face the great white throne judgment. If that should motivate us. That, that should make us, you know, want to share that with others. I hope we don't want that in anyone because that could be our family, our friends who are not saved. That's where they're going. And we can share that truth with them that can get them out of that judgment. That's where they're heading. May that motivate us to share him with other people. 
So since the fear of the Lord can motivate us, so can the love that Christ has for us, which is the second motivation that will allow us to have a greater impact for Christ, is understanding the love of Christ controls us. Understanding the love of Christ controls us. So as we look at the verse 14, we see for the love of Christ controls us. Now some of your versions may say constrains or compels us. It's the idea that Christ's love should motivate us. It should motivate us to share his truth with others. This motivated Paul, who clearly understood God's love for him. Because let's face it, you know, we, we tend to think of Paul as this super Christian sometimes, you know. He did all these amazing things in his ministry. He shared the gospel so much. He influenced many people for Christ. But he wasn't always a Christian. In fact, I want to take you to a couple passages. First one is Galatians chapter 1. So in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul describes himself this way. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was— oh, Oh, sorry, a wrong verse. Verse 13. For I have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. Okay, hold on just a second. Did you guys catch how Paul described himself? He described himself as a persecutor. He tried to destroy the church of God beyond measure. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't call him Christian of the Year, you know, for doing that. Now, if you think that's worse— Check out 1 Timothy chapter 1. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, if I can get there. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, see how Paul describes himself here. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which we found in Christ Jesus. So do you see how Paul described himself here? He described himself as a blasphemer, a violent aggressor, and a persecutor. Again, you wouldn't want to put him in ministry, would you? He wouldn't be your first choice to put in a children's ministry or any kind of ministry for that matter. But yet, God did. He had a great calling for him, as we read in the book of Acts. And he allowed him. He saved him from his sins. He rescued Paul from the, de the, the road of destruction he was on. And he became someone who was very influential in Christ. Christ displayed that love to him. And he rescued him. And he became such a great person of the faith. Now, I'm going to say something that might surprise some of you, but... I'm not perfect. I know, I know. It came as a shock to me when I found out too. But, but you know, I, I've done many sins against God. I've lied. I've stolen. I've said God's name in vain. And those are just three. Those are three of the many sins that I have committed in my life. But yeah, I'm right here preaching, sharing with you God's word today. It's not because of me. I did not deserve to be up here but it's because of Christ's love that he demonstrated to me. And that same love he demonstrates to all of us. He shows that same love to every single one of us in this room. Because as Romans 3.23 tells us, all have sinned, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have at one point have been enemies of God. But yet, which, which I remember my pastor at my home says, you should be grateful when you see a but in Scripture because that usually indicates a good thing. But Christ died for us. In fact, as we, as we read, continuing into verse 14, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. That one who died, that's Jesus Christ. You know, we celebrated Easter not too long ago, which is about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died on a cross for us, went through a severe torture, punishment for us. And he didn't have to, but he did. And he did that because he demonstrated his love towards us, as Romans 5 8 tells us. He showed us great love. And because of that, we're not on the road to death, but we are free. We are believers of Christ. We can follow Christ and we can share that love with others. Isn't that great news? I mean, that's the gospel. That's the gospel right there. But yet, do we share with other people? Do we share it with those who need it? Because as we look in verse 15, I mean, this is key. It says, and he died for all. 
so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We're not supposed to live for ourselves. We're not supposed to keep this truth of the gospel to ourselves. We can share with everyone. We should be sharing with everybody. But do we? Do we share with others? You know, I was thinking through this. You know, Nate gave a great illustration yesterday about marriage, and that made me think about my RA. So I don't know if you know my RA, but his name's Reed Plants. So go and read. <laughs> and, and if you know about Reed, not too long ago, he got engaged with, uh, last weekend, which that's awesome. Yeah, all right. Let's give him a round of applause. There we go. Awesome, awesome. And, and you can congratulate him on your own time afterwards. But, but I remember uh, it, it was in banquet when he got engaged, and that night, when he, that day when he got engaged, he, he told us in his suite that he got engaged. Now, I'm sure he told everybody. It was all over Facebook and everything. He didn't keep it to himself. He shared it with people who could listen. And I'm sure many of you who are engaged right here or are married can attest that you didn't keep it to yourselves when you were getting engaged or getting married. If anything, you told everyone that you could because it's a great time. It's one of the biggest moments in someone's life. But yet, do we do that? with Christ's love. Do we do that with Christ's love? Because, let's face it, you know, we, we get comfortable sometimes in this campus, you know, in this campus walls. But there is a world out there, outside of these walls, that have never heard the love of Christ ever in their lives. People who work in the businesses in CSU, or, or outside of CSU. People who are, use our facilities. People who are guests in our church. These people have never heard the love of Christ before and what he did for them. But do we think to share it with them? You know, I was really challenged by this because I thought of the times where I went to Walmart, you know, to get supplies or sheets for a midnight snack run, which I'm sure some of you uh, know what I mean by that. And I have many times walked right in and walked right out without ever share, ever even saying a word, let alone sharing Christ's love for them. Do you think they saw Christ's love in me? Do you think they saw anything of God in me? Probably not, because my motivation wasn't right. And I'm sure, you know, many of you have been in situations like that where you have even thought about to share Christ's love with others. And we weren't really that effective then for Christ, were we? But you know what? We can be. You know, we, we think we have to wait until we get to our future careers in order to be effective, but truth be told, we can be that right now. We can do that right now. You know, we don't, you know, we can share the love of Christ with reach people right now. And we can have that motivation right now. Because many of you have people in your world of influence that are unsaved. Whether it's friends or family or co-workers, whoever it may be. But yet, how many times have you shared the love of Christ with others? I don't want an answer or anything, but if the answer to that is no, or you haven't hardly done that, then I challenge you to think of one person, just, just one person, one person in your world who you can share Christ's love with. It could be a friend, a family member, a coworker, whoever it may be. It's important to share it because we ourselves can be reconcilers for God. We can reconcile people back to God, which Andreas will get more into depth in his message tomorrow. But we can do that. But I want you to make a priority this week with that one person to share the love of Christ with that person. You know, because we can do this now. And by doing it now, you know, that'll prepare us to be even more effective when we go into our future careers, wherever that may be for all of you here this morning be effective, more effective in our future careers. So what can we take away from what we discussed here today? Well, if anything, I hope all of you are aware of what motivates you, motivates us, because living a life without a clear sense of what motivates us will cause us to not nearly be effective as we could be. And all of us want to be effective in our future careers, but we won't be as much without a clear motivation of how we can impact others for Christ. So we looked at two motivations. We looked at understanding the fear of the God, fear of the Lord, and understanding the love that Christ has for us. So as we conclude here, I, I want to uh, put up a quote up here that I want you to interact with, uh, a slide that I want you to interact with. And, you know, whether you're taking notes or you have your phone, take a picture of this. I want you to just interact with this for a few seconds. 
If my motivation was knowing the terror of the Lord towards lost individuals and embracing the love of Christ has for me and others, how would I act differently towards lost people? How would I, how would you, how would we act differently towards lost individuals, you yourself? Because you have a different influence than other people do to share Christ's love with others. So how would you look differently? How would that look for you in sharing the love of Christ with others? How would that look for you? Because if I'm, if I'm being honest, as I, as I thought about this myself, because I, I don't want to give anyone homework that I haven't done myself, or at least you hope the teacher doesn't give you homework that they haven't done themselves. As, yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> uh, so just don't say that to your professors or anything. I, I still want to be here next year. But, but as I thought about this myself, I thought, of, I thought of three ways how I could respond differently towards lost people. And I want to share that with you as we close this morning. The first is that I'll give myself more opportunities to share Christ with unbelievers. You know, wherever I'm at, you know, whether it's being at a store or being at home with my family or whatever it may be, you know, I want to use that as an opportunity to share Christ's love with others, no matter how it may look against me. So that's my first one. The second one is I want to build lasting relationships with those who don't know Christ. You know, it's more than just interacting with someone once and just being done. You know, it's all about building relationships, which with building that relationship, you know, that can propel you to have a future conversation that could result in salvation down the road. You don't know how God can work in that. And the final one is I'll look at them being thrown into the lake of fire. Like, I cannot get that picture out of my head looking at unbelievers. And that kind of scares me. I hope that that scares you as well. And so that can motivate me even more to share Christ's love with other people. So I've given you how I will strive to, to, to act differently towards lost people. But the question I want to leave you with is, how about you? How will the fear of God and the love of Christ have you act differently towards lost people? How will you be different as you leave here and go back to classes, or even go towards the summer moving forward? So join with me as I close in prayer. Dearly Father, I thank you for this day today. And I thank you for everyone that's here, Lord. No one is here by accident. You have, there's so much talent here. There's so much potential to, for people to be influencers of you, to be reconcilers of you. And I just thank you for that. And I just ask that you allow us to know what these motivations are, to know the terror of the Lord and the love that you have for everyone. And may that motivate us to be able to go out there to a world that doesn't know you and to share your love, to share what you've done with, all, with everyone who doesn't know you. I thank you for this day and just allow us to finish the semester strong and for us to always keep you in the center of our hearts and minds. For it is your name that I pray. Amen. Thank you.